After Sunday's preseason game against the Indianapolis Colts, could there be a quarterback two battle between Jarrett Stidham and Zach Wilson? We'll tell you why we think there might be here on today's brand new episode, Locked on Broncos. You are Locked on Broncos, your daily Denver Broncos podcast, part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. What's up, Broncos country? Welcome into another episode, Locked on Broncos, your daily Denver Broncos podcast, part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. Thanks once again, everyone in Broncos country, all the everydayers out there. Thanks for making us your first listen wherever you get your podcasts or available on YouTube every single day, all year long. I'm Cody Rourke, Broncos reporter for Mile High Sports, joined alongside, as always, by Sarah Bettinger, site expert over there, predominantly orange.com. And really on today's episode of the show, there are some questions following the aftermath of the Broncos 34 to 30 victory against the Indianapolis Colts in week one of the NFL preseason. What are some of the question marks on this team right now? We'll take a look at the punter competition, a little bit of an update there, and whether or not Jalen Virgil can make his case with his special teams aspect that he brings to the table. We're also wondering, why was Marvin Mims playing so late into Sunday's game in the preseason? And on top of that, because of that, is there a competition brewing between Jarrett Stidham and Zach Wilson for the potential QB2 spot? Looking at all the tea leaves here, there's a lot that we'll break down on today's episode of the show here. But look, Sarah, let's start things off. Let's kick off the action. Is there a quarterback two battle between Jarrett Stidham and Zach Wilson? I think the first inclination that people are going to say, based on the fact that, okay, well, we've been told, and it has primarily been this, is that Bo Nix, Jarrett Stidham competing for the starting job at the quarterback position. But I think really after Sunday's preseason game, with how comfortable Bo looked, I think a lot of Broncos country is on board with Bo being the starter. Look, let him grow. Let him continue, let, let him take his lumps. But let him be the starter because he showcased some things that were like, hey, that is a nice thing to see inside the Broncos offense. But to me, you look at Jarrett Stidham, Sarah, 11 total snaps. That to me was probably the biggest surprise coming out of Sunday's game. Bo and Zach got significantly more snaps. And granted, look, Jarrett was the starter for that game. 11 snaps, though, I felt like that's not enough for Jarrett. I didn't think so either, honestly, especially with the way that his teammates kind of let him down. I think you, if you box score scout, you're going to see that Jarrett Stidham was four of seven, 37 yards, and an interception with a quarterback rating of 32.1. Probably would have had a better quarterback rating if he had thrown, you know, a handful of more incomplete passes. But Cody, to me, I think we saw Jarrett do some nice things. You saw him sidestep some pressure, make a throw across his body to the other side of the field, I believe, to Lil Jordan Humphrey. Uh, we saw him hit Cortland Sutton. And, and I think that pass play to Samaj P. Ryan, that could have been a first down. That was, I mean, that was good flow. It felt like he was running the offense well. And, and I, I, I know that Jarrett gets kind of this stigma for being ultra conservative. So I was kind of wanting to see a little bit more from him, but you people might be surprised to find out the highest quarterback rating on the day for the Broncos against the Colts was actually Zach Wilson over 103 quarterback rating. And obviously he had that big pass play to Blake Watson, which was a nice pass. It wasn't just a let's dump it off to Blake and let him go. Actually it was a really good throw from Zach Wilson to set him up for the yards after the catch. So Zach Wilson, Jarrett Stidham, to me, there's a big talent discrepancy, but there's also a big decision-making discrepancy. And in the event that you would need one of these two guys to start, which one do you go with? Do you go with the guy that operates the offense a little more cleanly, or do you go with the talent upside? And I think we know all who I'm talking about. Zach Wilson has much, he may be the most talented guy in the quarterback room for the Broncos, right? I mean, the former second overall pick. So he has the talent if he can operate the offense like we saw, though, against the Colts, he may have a case to be quarterback, too. Yeah, and look, I think you, maybe thinking about it from Sean Payton's standpoint, what would Sean rather prefer, right? Because, I mean, you talk about talent. Sean's had some talent. Russell Wilson had talent. Don't get me wrong. But the decision-making, you know, protecting the football, that's something that Zach Wilson has struggled with. Now, I think he did a really good job in Sunday's preseason game against the guys he was playing with. And I think ideally, in a, in a real-world situation, I don't know, I forget what, I think I was talking with Andrew Mason during Friday's practice. And we're like, you know what? Don't be surprised if Zach Wilson comes out, lights it up against you know the Colts late in the game. He should. He's a former first-round pick. He should light it up against those types of players who are considered third-string, maybe fourth-string type of guys that are really fighting for a 53-man roster spot. But then it's like, all right, I, I liked what Zach did, and I liked what Jared did. I think 
all three quarterbacks on Sunday did a good job of getting the football out of their hands. We talk about timing, getting out quick. Neither of the quarterbacks got sacked on the day. And obviously, all three of them have this underrated mobility factor. Heck, Jarrett Stidham even had this one play where there was pressure coming around. And, you know, he initially was trying to step up. Nothing was there. He did a little spin move to get at least four or five yards. Positive yardage trajectory. Um, I felt like also what plagued Jarrett's drive were penalties, and it wasn't necessarily Jarrett's fault. You had the false start of Mike McGlitch. You had a holding call by Garrett Bowles. You had the terrible taunting call by the officials You know, on Tim Patrick. Like, let Tim celebrate that moment. I think we're all in agreement there. And, the, and then, obviously, you, know, you mentioned the interception. Like, if people – and I'm glad you brought it up. So many people watch the stat box or the box score and say, wow – this guy was terrible. You see it all the time. It's it's one of the biggest engagement farming things we now see on social media. Jarrett didn't play a bad game. I thought Jarrett delivered the ball's rhythm, consistency. So for me, and like in terms of our conversation here, like is there a legitimate QB2 battle between Jarrett Stidham and Zach Wilson? Maybe, maybe at this point. And here's why. Like, Sarah, you and I have hinted on this before from the financial aspect. If the Broncos were to somehow move on or trade or release Jarrett Stidham, they would save around $5 million in cap space this year. How important is that to the Broncos right now? Probably not as important considering they're in a, actually a pretty decent position. But on the other hand, too, if you're not going to keep three quarterbacks on your 53, you, you traded for Zach Wilson, low risk, potential high reward type of stuff. Can Zach be the type of backup that Sean is looking for? I, I don't know if we have an answer to that. I just know that based on looking at what Jarrett Stidham has done, I feel like Jarrett would probably be the most beneficial player for Bo inside the locker room if Bo is the starter. So I, I mean, I don't know where it's going, but I think that there could be maybe this week some credence to maybe a QB2 battle. I'm curious, with Bo getting the start, is Bo going to get 11 reps and then Jarrett going to get 39? You know, this I don't know what the roles are going to look like this week. I'm very curious to see how it's going to play out. And that will be met with a lot of pushback from Broncos country if that does happen, right? If Bo Nix goes out there, you know, his teammates, if let's just say we copy and paste everything that happened and yet Bo is the first one out there and Jarrett is the second like if Bo and his teammates let him down out there and he only gets 11 snaps, like people will be furious of the fact that he doesn't get more. And so especially being the fact that it's his first start in the preseason. So we know these joint practices will weigh heavily in the evaluation as well. So we can't discount that either. And maybe the snaps from the joint practice will be taken into account by the coaching staff as well, because I don't know if they're going to do some scrimmage like stuff. I'm sure they'll do plenty of 11 on 11, things like that when Green Bay comes. But it's it's going to be one of those things, Cody, that bears monitoring because how often does Broncos country rally around the third quarterback that gets in line, you know, in the preseason? It's been, if it's not Kyle Sloter, it's Chad Kelly, it's all these other guys, you know, the Sloter house. There was all this hype around these different guys that have come in. At Trevor Simeon being maybe the most notable and maybe it's all Trevor Simeon's fault, right? Because the guy was the third quarterback for so long and then he was actually, you know, the best quarterback on the team, which is kind of sad to think about. But uh, no, in all honesty, Trevor, he was a pretty good player. But I think with Zach Wilson, it's a similar deal. You go out there, you dominate against the third stringers on the other side, and all of a sudden everybody's talking like, well, let's see what he could do if he's the second quarterback or what he could do with the starters. And so not that it's a, a competition with Bo Nix right now, but I do think when you talk about the financial aspect, roster gymnastics that have to be done in terms of who do you get to keep on this 53? How much does keeping three quarterbacks impact that? There could be a, dis a discussion had about this quarterback two battle that, you know, I think bears monitoring as we progress into the preseason. Broncos country, always eager for your thoughts on this. Let us know. Do you think that there could be a QB two battle brewing between Jarrett Stidham and Zach Wilson as the final two games of the preseason really come to a head here? And then the regular season is right there. That week one opener against the Seahawks. It is close. And look, one thing, Broncos country, there are so many questions that we still have that will hopefully be answered throughout the NFL preseason. We came away with the big question, though, from Sunday's game. Marvin Mims, for some reason, was popping out in terms of being able to play in the third quarter. I think even in the fourth quarter, when we look at where things were at, is there a reason to be concerned that he was playing so deep into the NFL preseason? We'll analyze maybe some insight into why on today's episode, Lockdown Broncos. Today's episode of Locked On Broncos is brought to you by eBay Motors. Passion, drive, and patience. The formula for winning championships is also what keeps your ride or die alive. eBay Motors has everything you need to maintain your vehicle and level it up 
to peak performance. Superchargers, roof racks, exhaust kits, LED headlights, and much more. Whether you're into speed, power, or style, eBay Motors has you covered. With over 122 million parts for your number one ride or die, you'll always find exactly what you're looking for. And with eBay Guaranteed Fit, your part is guaranteed to fit your ride every time or your money back. Because with eBay Motors, you're burning rubber, not cash. With all the parts you need at the prices you want, it's easy to make your car the MVP and bring home huge wins. Keep your ride or die alive at ebaymotors.com. Eligible items only. Exclusions apply. eBay guaranteed fit. Only available to U.S. customers. Broncos country, there's no reason to be worried about Marvin Mims playing deep into the second half of the team's first preseason game, but we're going to throw the tinfoil hats on anyway and think of some reasons why the Broncos may have done that on today's episode, Locked On Broncos. But thank you so much, Broncos country, for making Cody and I, your boys here, your first listen of the day every single day, free and available everywhere that you get your podcasts as well as on YouTube. And if you haven't done so already, hit subscribe on your favorite podcast platform platform and on YouTube so that we can get the word out. Broncos country, what else, what's going on today in front of everybody out there? And for your second listen, go ahead, check out Locked On Fantasy Football as you prepare for your drafts and certainly get some help like I need every single year around this time. Cody, let's uh, let's talk about Marvin Mims and, and the reason why he was maybe playing deep into this game. Of course, we know that the Broncos planned on giving Bo Nix some reps with the first team offense or what was what pieces of it were out there for this game. We saw that in the first half and, and we didn't really see that extend into his all of his different drives there. But what we did see was obviously Marvin caught the touchdown pass from Bo Nix. And then I think everybody was a little surprised to still see him out there for the second half when when the team you know brought Bo Nix back out there again. Were you surprised to see Marvin out there? And what was your take on maybe why he was still playing that deep into the game? Yeah, it kind of shows him as having like 17 snaps in the game. But, you know, you mentioned him being in the in the game as late as he was. I think that was something that I was, we were like, why? Like, why is he out there? I'll give Broncos country a little bit of insight in there. I don't, Marvin, and I don't want to say he struggled, right? But Marvin has had some moments during training camp where he's been frustrated. And it hasn't gone, I think, the way that he is hoped for. Or, you know, the looks that maybe he's getting haven't amplified yet to, you know, where he can be. Like, remember in OTAs, we saw him get behind the entire defense for a touchdown. We really haven't seen that here in training camp. And so I think that there's been some frustration for him. There was a couple of days, you know, where, you know, he's had some nice catches, but then there's been a couple of days where, you know, the, the ball was either thrown too far in front of him or too far behind him. I know Zach Wilson, you know, was a proponent on that on a couple of occasions. But I think the thing with Marvin is that just the, the coaching staff wants to give him more looks. That's really it. And I don't think it has anything to do with like, oh, like the team doesn't believe in Marvin. Like the team has a lot of belief in Marvin, especially as a return option. But they're really trying to say, okay, hey, we need to get Marvin to a point inside of this offensive scheme where if we're going to get him more manufactured looks this upcoming season, he's got to be able to get more reps to be able to see what that's going to look like. And Marvin can obviously polish up on some things, you know, in terms of his route running, uh, you know, focus, but he's got a great attitude, a great mindset there. To me, I know fans were worried like, oh, what is, does this mean that Marvin is on the seat, a hot seat, especially with, you know, some of the other guys that have been stepping up at wide receiver with Devon Vele's emergence. And, you know, you talk about other guys like Troy Franklin, who only saw one target on the afternoon. And it was a deep threat there. But Denver's wide receiver room has so many guys there. It's like, all right, is there a reason to be concerned when it comes to Marvin? I'm not concerned. It's just that the coaching staff needs to get him more looks, and I think that's exactly what they were doing here in this game. But, I mean, it really kind of poses some questions here, Sarah, as we continue to dive deeper. Like, if he's primed for a major role, the fact that maybe he's not comfortable just yet, is that is that a concern to you, or do you feel like he could be behind if that's the case? Well, I'm not concerned at this point, Cody, but I, I do think it's interesting because of what we saw last year, right? When Sean Payton had guys like Randy Gregory and, and Frank Clark out there deep into the preseason, and we were wondering the same type of stuff. Now, those aren't the same type, types of situations. I think that if, if Sean could go back and do it all over again, I think he would have got rid of those guys way sooner than he did. Marvin is, is a different case. This is not a situation where I think he's in the proverbial doghouse. I think this is a case where, like you said, he just needs more time on task. Like 
I can't tell you, I, I, as I put together my weekly NFL power rankings for NFL spin zone, I'm sitting here confused. Like, why did Drake May throw three passes? Why didn't Bryce Young play for the Panthers? And, and I'm wondering, as I'm looking at all these other teams around the league, like, why did some of these young guys not play? Or why did they get such limited snaps in when they've really done nothing to earn that? I think that Marvin Mims is a situation where, like, the hype is there because he's a you know second round pick, but it's important to remember like Marvin was a late second round pick and he didn't get a ton of action in his rookie year. We saw glimpses at the beginning of the year. We saw glimpses throughout the season. We didn't see a guy that was dominating the target share. We didn't see a guy who had multiple hundred yard games. There's there's really no reason why Marvin should be getting treated like a veteran starter at this point. And I say that with all due respect in terms of like what we expect from him. I think Broncos country is expecting him to be, you know, this guy who plays like a high second round pick. And, and I get that he's got speed. He's, he showed, he's got strong hands. He can win vertically. He can win after the catch. He may be one of the only guys on this team who really excels after the catch. But to me, Marvin Mims has done absolutely nothing to, to warrant, you know, being on the sidelines without his shoulder pads on in the second quarter of a preseason game. Now, could, could I be eating crow next week against the Packers and that happens? Sure. But at the same time, I'm with you. I think he needs more snaps and he needs more time on task. And it's not a bad thing either. I think Marvin will benefit from it more. And look, there's nuances. Like even, I, I think you look at Cortland Sutton, who's probably the most tenured guy. I mean, outside of Josh Reynolds and Tim Patrick, like Cortland Sutton himself had even mentioned when we had a press conference with him during training camp about where he can just evolve in his game. Like he says, just the nuance on my routes, my release, like, there's always room to get better. And, and for a guy like Marvin, like Marvin is a speed guy, right? But I think the thing is you don't want Marvin to just be the speed guy. You want Marvin to be the, hey, we're going to cut you, you know, death by a thousand paper cuts in this situation. Like we need to be able to attack you vertically. We want to be able to get you the ball in the flats or on a bubble screen. And then you take it the rest of the way. We want to be able to hit you on a slant and then you do damage yards after the catch across the middle of the field. Like we've seen pieces of that incorporated in training camp and OTAs with Marvin specifically, but it's going to take time. I think to build up to where he wants to be or he needs to be. And I know like when fans are out there at, at practice and when they've seen like the time where he was frustrated, I think it's just more so Marvin is an ultra competitive guy. Just being around him, talking to him, he's competitive. He wants to have success and he wants to do things the right way. And if there's anybody who's hard on him, it's Marvin. Marvin's probably harder on himself than anybody else. And so there's a fine line you want to find with that. Like how do you massage that as a coaching staff? Like you, you want to get these looks there are things out of Marvin's control in terms of like how the quarterback throws you the football or if he overshoots you, it's hot. Like there's the mental toughness aspect to it during practice. And so I don't read anything into it. We know Marvin is a game changer on special teams in the return game. And Marvin can be a game changer when it comes to the receiver room. Is he going to be wide receiver two, wide receiver three? Probably not. Like in, in terms of just maybe volume of, of targets. But if you have Cortland Sutton, Tim Patrick, Josh Reynolds, let's factor in Greg Dulcich or Lucas Crow into this mix. If you have these balance of production spread out amongst these guys, and it's like all of a sudden now you bring in Marvin, it's like strategic, right? Like we talked about the running back position. You have Javante Williams in there and Audrey Kesteman. Let's say they're just gashing. They're just like physically imposing their will against defenses and defenses are tired. What are you going to do? I'm going to throw Jaleel McLaughlin a toss play and he's going to run it for 70 yards for a touchdown. Maybe it, like that's the formula. I think with Marvin is like, be strategic with how you use him and still feature him. I think that's something we'll see kind of play out here as the regular season comes about. Will he see it in week two of the preseason? Maybe, maybe not. I don't think Sean wants to give away too much just yet, but I feel like it was worth us talking about here on today's episode of the show. And look, there's some other questions that we have, you know, coming off the heels of the Broncos 34 to 30 victory against the Colts. What is going on with the punter competition? We had a little bit of an interesting insight into that in Sunday's game. And on top of that, how is the return dynamic going to play out here for the Broncos opposite of Marvin Mims? That's something we'll break down and much more here on today's episode. Locked on Broncos. Today's show is brought to you by LinkedIn. When you're hiring for your small business, you want to find quality professionals that are right for the role. That's why you have to check out LinkedIn Jobs. LinkedIn Jobs has the tools to help find the right professionals for your team faster 
and for free. And you know, LinkedIn, it's not just a job board. LinkedIn helps you hire professionals that you can't find anywhere else. Even those who aren't actively searching for a new job, but they might be open to the perfect role, whatever role you have available on your team. So in a given month, over 70% of LinkedIn users, they don't visit other leading job sites. So if you're not looking on LinkedIn, you're looking in the wrong place. And on LinkedIn, 86% of small businesses, they get a qualified candidate within 24 hours. Hire professionals like a professional on LinkedIn. And LinkedIn knows that small businesses, you wear so many different hats and you may not have the time or the resources to hire. And LinkedIn is constantly finding ways to make this process easier. And they even just launched a feature that helps you write job descriptions, making the process even easier and quicker. 2.5 small businesses use LinkedIn for hiring. So post your job for free at linkedin.com slash locked on NFL. That's linkedin.com slash locked on NFL to post your job for free terms and conditions apply. As we jump into the fourth quarter action on today's episode, Lockdown Broncos, we'll come over some of the other questions that we had following the Broncos preseason game, particularly on the special team side of the ball in the return game. And also punting competition where there was only one punter who got a primary share of the reps in the game against the Indianapolis Colts. That's what we're going to break down here on today's episode of the show for all you everydayers and first listeners out there. Thank you so much. You make lockdown Broncos exactly what it is. We appreciate you, Sarah, you know, amidst all these position battles that are going on with the Broncos right now, special teams wise, there's a punter competition, but if you watch Sunday's game, you wouldn't have thought or known that there was a punter competition based on the fact Riley Dixon, was the only guy who got the first two punts, which was a little interesting because I felt like they would switch Trenton Gill and obviously Riley Dixon, one punt, one punt, like alternate whoever goes out there. It was Riley Dixon getting the reps there, and you know he actually had a pretty solid outing there. So what's going on here with this punter competition, in your opinion? Well, you can't help but wonder if now Trenton Gill is going to get the reps against the Green Bay Packers because, thankfully, the Broncos didn't have to punt a ton against the Indianapolis Colts. How nice. And that's that. that's what you want. Yeah, we, we need more of that. So, uh, But, you know, you figured if you're in a real competition, right, the first guy goes out there for the first punt and then the second guy goes out there. If, you, if you're anticipating not punting a lot, you might want to get both of those guys reps. I need to go back and watch, Cody, because I didn't take note of who was the holder on all of the field goals, extra points, things like that. So we may have to go back and watch, or if somebody in the comments can kind of let us know if you if you did take note of that. Um, and I also think Will Lutz took all the kickoffs, if memory serves me right there. So that was something we had kind of speculated as, you know, could Trenton Gill potentially be an option on the kickoffs? Like, is that going to be an, as an asset for him? Like, I don't know. So I, I don't know exactly what their plan is here, but you're carrying two punters on the roster right now. And even though you have 90 players or 91 in the case of the internet, national exemption with Thomas Yasmin, I, why would you carry two punters if you're not going to give the guys reps out there on the field? And from what we heard from Ben Kotwika, the punting competition was going pretty well. And he said that these two guys were both hitting the ball as well as he's seen in any punter competition that he's ever had. So I would expect then Trenton Gill to get the reps here against the Green Bay Packers. I didn't even think about it when you said that, right? Like we talked about, okay, Riley got the two punting attempts that Denver had on the day. Did he get the holding snaps? Like I, I forgot about that because that's going to be one. Like both these guys have been switching off as holders for Will Lutz on the on the field goal and obviously the PAT unit. So that will be something interesting to go back. Like even after rewatching it, I didn't even notice. It. I didn't even pay attention to that. Like that's it's one of those positions where like, wait a minute, that's actually an important element of the game. And look, I know Riley Dixon had that botched hold against the Buffalo Bills. He had the turf burn and everything like that. Luckily, it didn't hurt the Broncos in that game because they ended up kicking a game-winning field goal against Buffalo on Monday Night Football. Um, but for me, I'm also very curious. Like I, I have been impressed with both of these guys. And look, for Riley, I, I was a little surprised when they brought in Trent Gill in the offseason and it was like, oh, they're going to have a punter competition. Like, what for? Like, Riley was pretty good last year. So I, I think it just means they're trying to find ways to consistently elevate their process on special teams, it continues to be one of the areas where Denver, you know, has shined. I, I felt very pleased with watching Denver's special teams play in Sunday's game when we're talking about kick coverage and also the kicking game. And you're going to see, I think, some wrinkles added here and there as the regular season comes about, especially with the new return rules, how Denver defends certain things and how obviously Denver will run some things in the return game. 
But that kind of transitions perfectly into our next talking point here. The kick return game, I think, is going to be a very interesting conversation. Now, I think, think if I'm not mistaken, there were two big returns over the first week of the NFL preseason. I, I forget who had the other one, what team, but I know that Jalen Virgil had one of the other ones. If I'm not mistaken, I think he maybe had the biggest return out of everybody so far on the weekend. Could be wrong on that, but he's in the top two. For me, Jalen is a guy who we talk about this wide receiver room right now and how deep it is. I, we talked about in the post game report our concerns about the Broncos, re, like Blake Watson fumbling the football. Like he he put a return on the ground, he put a handoff on the ground. Ball security has been an issue for Blake Watson during training camp. Jalen Virgil may not get all the looks right now in the receiving game, but this dynamic here of him being in the returner, he had three returns there, and he had the most return yardage, and obviously that set it up. That bodes well for a guy like him who's fighting for like, hey. It, you need a guy opposite of Marvin Mims to return effectively. Jalen and Marvin Mims, I I can't help but say I like that pairing. I like that dynamic duel. No offense to Jaleel McLaughlin, who we know is fast. I just don't want to see Jaleel McLaughlin get blown up on kick return. I, I would rather see Jalen Virgil, who's bigger, stockier, and Marvin Mims, who's fast and elusive. I would rather see those guys return the kicks this upcoming season. I completely agree on that. And the other team or the other player that may have had the only longer return than Jalen Virgil Cody might have been Gould on the other side of the field in this game with the Colts he had a 49 yard kick return in the game as I'm checking the box score here just looking at all the different numbers for the Broncos guys you see Gould had five for 138 on the other side with a 49 yarder but Virgil at three returns for 88 yards proving exactly what I think you and I believe is his ticket to the roster. Because if you extrapolate that 88 yards on three returns over 17 games, that's nearly 1,500 kickoff return yards throughout the season. And that is a lot of positive field position. for the, I mean, if you're, let's say you're catching the ball around the five, between the five and the seven yard line every time, and you're averaging 29, 30 yards a return, I mean, you're getting the ball out to, just do the math right? I mean, you're getting the ball out to, I mean, not far from midfield. You're about 10 yards away from midfield, 10, 12 yards. So that to me is a huge asset and it would really just amplify. Look, think about the, the domino effect that that has. You catch the ball at the five, you return it 30 yards to the 35. You're starting field position at the 35 yard line. You're now 20 ish yards away from getting within probably Will Lutz range every drive. And Bo Nix playing efficient football. He's willing to kind of nickel and dime you if he needs to. We saw him take some shots, but just think about the domino effect there. So with Jalen Virgil doing what he did on three opportunities, I just think that that is, we've been talking about it all off season. We can't wait to see how these, this new kickoff format changes the dynamic for somebody like him. Three returns for 88 yards, including a 43 yard return. I mean, that'll do it. That'll do it right there. If you're averaging 30 yards or a kick return, so to me, Cody, I think this was a huge performance from him. We saw Tyler Beatty with a nice return. I think Tremont Smith would have would have potentially busted one up the middle if he didn't trip himself up. Um, so there's a couple of different guys here competing for roster spots in a critical area. And, and on top of that, too, I I have weighed and debated this in my head. Like, if you're going to feature Marvin Mims more on offense, look, I understand that he's going to get looks, and he's your most dynamic return guy. But do you maybe sacrifice that return aspect by saying, hey, we have one or two guys that are already on this roster. We know, hey, can be very capable while Marvin can be game changer. I still think Marvin should return the punts. I think that's probably going to be the most important thing. Marvin should return the punts because he's dynamic. He's great at tracking the football. But if you could switch it up on kick return, you know, maybe try it. But it's like Jalen Virgil, in my opinion, if you look at everybody else on this roster, Probably is the best suit to do. I think we forget. Like, remember Jalen Virgil's rookie season in the preseason? He had, like, he was a dynamic return guy. Like, there was, like, punt returns, kick returns. Like, okay, hey, there's a reason why they like this guy. And then, obviously, he goes out and he catches passes downfield, you know, at a higher rate. Like, that was an exciting thing to see. Jalen is a guy on this roster right now that I think when you look at the position, you look at all the competition going on, nobody's talking about Jalen Virgil enough. And I think he's also in a position right now to be a sneaky sneak into the back end of the 53 because of his return dynamic. Not just that, but also him as a gunner, him as a jammer. Like he is a core four special teams guy for Ben Kotwika and Mike Westhoff. 
you put him on waivers potentially. He's the one guy, I think him, Brandon Johnson, are probably the two guys at that position that will probably get picked up by another team. So I'm very, very curious to see how this pans out. You know, as the regular season approaches, we're going to get more looks here this week because this was the first time like we didn't even see Jalen get returns in practice. So the fact that he got three returns in a game says like, all right, maybe they're just waiting for the game to kind of say, hey, we already know what you can bring to the table. The other guys, we want to get reps in practice because we don't know just yet. So we'll see how it all plays out here. But Broncos country, we appreciate you so much for tuning in and listening here. Locked on Broncos. One thing that Sarah and I are going to do as you get ready for tomorrow's episode of the show for all you every dares, we will do a little bit of a stock report. We'll take a look at the offensive side of the ball, the defensive side of the ball, whose stock went up from preseason week one, whose stock went down and who needs to find a way to bounce back. We'll break all that down and much more on tomorrow's brand new episode. Locked on Broncos.